podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, Warriors. How's everyone doing in face? Dollar pushing to new highs here. Not ready to fade it. I don't see this as a turnaround Tuesday, maybe some type of recovery. Euro still has not made a new low with this push, showing some resiliency. Some of the weakness of not making new highs would be Swiss, but it looks like it should or could. Confirmed highs here. Big smash in S&Ps. We close under 2740. I would say that would uh, terminate it, make this look like a false break breakout here. Also, I was talking about USD SEC yesterday when we were here, anticipating one more high. We're almost there to manifest a third drive. It'll have to do some work because the momentum's pretty strong. Very high reading here on the four hour. One hour, it's off the charts. What is that, 88? Okay, so you have to wait for a distribution phase even though uh, once we achieve the third drive, uh, you know, one third drive that Blake pointed out yesterday on the weekly in NASDAQ, we're now getting a nice little reversal week. I thought after the way it closed yesterday, there might be a shot for another push up. It's looking less likely now. 7350 and this is starting to look like uh, the top for the summer swoon may be in here and let's see what else did i want to cover here nice call by blake on canada continuation move there so really the feature is a dollar um you know the yen never violated except for a couple of pokes above these return lines. Uh, we're back inside it. I, I had a couple of wedge lines that broke this one, uh, broke this one, making the targets 108 or lower. Uh, now I'd wait if you missed it uh, for rallies back towards uh, 10 and a quarter uh, for a shorting opportunity. To me, this is uh, was the one that gave the best signal as far as dollar pairs not even being able to take out this 1120 level here. So uh, the end looks very negative and you have to sell rallies there. Uh, what's interesting is even though the yen is weaker, I know a lot of people follow the um, you normally when the yen is weaker, you get a bounce in the metals. This is how bad the metals are continuation move here in, in gold and even silver you're getting a breakdown uh, starting to look uh, I've been talking 1580 although I didn't think we'd have this first but now it looks like we're headed towards that at 1580 and if I really want to be bearish uh, silver long term I could see 1450 so uh, those are some of my looks I don't see anything off the bat to fade so turnaround Tuesday could just be continuation day Tuesday. We'll see what happens here. Have a great, uh, you know, speaking of the metals, and one of the leaders has been copper, and everyone was talking about the breakout last week. Breakout negated, divergent, glaring. So even copper, which has been the leadership in the metals, is showing signs of caving at least for a correction from here. And Mickey Fulp is, uh, his Twitter handles at Mercenary Geo. He is by profession a geologist. He's uh, been on the ground, he knows miners. So we'll be able to cover all the different metals today with Mickey, uh, ask him what he sees going on. Uh, I know he also favors uranium, um, you know, uranium, Maybe there's not as much of demand for uranium either since we have total peace with North Korea now and uh, or we're going to stop Iran from getting a nuke. So maybe not as much demand for uranium, but I'm going to ask him about that too. So if you're a metalhead, and I'm not talking about following the band Metallica, 
uh, stick around for Mickey Fulp. He knows his stuff. So Blake King Dollar continuation move. Uh, uh, Yesterday's close in the yen had us thinking about where we could sell it higher, and it, it never broke out. So yeah, you know, uh, um, uh, it was uh, uh, some pretty big overnight move. Now, now I I have exited my dollar Canadian longs um, th today at seventy four. I think is where I got out. Um, but I I'm looking for I'm looking to reload. Uh, dollar Canadian longs on a dip uh, towards 132 if I can get it uh, it's been a pretty pretty massive move yeah nice trade hard to fade anything uh, fade dollar strength anywhere Isn't yeah you it? know uh, it, it is I, I actually um, I, I shorted some dollar Canadian uh, right at um, 80 uh, 89 and then I sold I, I, I shorted it here I covered it at 79 and everybody's like, oh yeah, I thought you were gonna write it down to you know 132, and I'm like, yeah, it's counter trend. It's it's hard. It's a hard trade to take, yeah. um, but it is you know, I do think that we're we're probably going to see you know limited upside from here. Um, now now you want to look for for pullbacks in the dollar Canadian, you know, back to 132 or so if you can get it, and that's what I'm hoping for because I, I really would like to reload. Uh, dollar Canadian longs because uh, obviously um, you know this is a very bullish breakout but you know um, can we can we continue to extend here you you look at the euro dollar and the euro dollar it, it looks extremely weak so that 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 feeds into that um, you know uh, dollar strength is the euro dollar so weak one of the discussions that we were having uh, in the office this morning is 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 really if you think about what has happened in 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 the U.S. and how we are better prepared at this point in time for any type of um, trade war, trade war, shock, whatever the case may be, um, the 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 Fed has raised rates and allowed for the ability to to be a little bit more flexible. Uh, as you know, we had talked for the last couple of years, Dale, this is not anything new, that the Fed is raising rates in the event that there's going to be another recession, crisis. We, we have the tools back in the toolbox to use where Europe, you know, I don't know, what are they going to do? What are they going to, you know, what, what are they going to? What are they going to do in another financial shock? Um, their their options are very limited at this point in time. So uh, I I can't imagine the the euro getting much stronger from here at this point. You know we're gonna we're gonna have that old conversation is you know what's the what's the what's the cleanest dirty shirt in the hamper that we got to put on and and you know maybe that ends up being the dollar um it, I, I i don't know but well, i, I think we're getting our answer anyway how the dollar would react to trade tensions trade war uh, a lot of people thought that was going to be dollar negative uh, uh, i don't think they could argue that anymore yeah i i i i would agree with that dale it's um it, it it's it's uh and and think you know we hearing hearing what um donald trump is doing well what is uh his his threat is overnight to you know um enact tariffs on another excuse yeah. me 200 billion worth of uh chinese goods i mean that's that's uh that's a pretty a uh, big number and a big risk now to the markets. Um, you know, my my wife was like last night. She's like, "Well, what's that going to do for us?" I'm like, "Well, that what that's going to do is it's going to raise prices uh, on, for consumer goods if 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 something like that happens quite dramatically here in the U.S. and and when when goods, you know, I, I don't know how what the percentage of goods that we buy that are Chinese uh, here in the United States, but uh, but the numbers. Yeah, I would say it's probably in the 80 percentile range, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, if if I had to guess, I, I, it's somewhere up in that neighborhood. Um, and and if that's the case, 
you, you have to imagine price is going to go up everywhere on everything. And how's that, how's that going to, you know, how's that going to fare with the consumer? Um, I would, I would assume the consumer uh, gets hit the, the worst and then, then consumer sentiment drops and consumer sentiment drops and then uh, business sentiment starts to erode. And, and, and then you have real estate prices start to, you know, depress. And I mean, it, it, it's, it's a, a yeah, whole multitude of things that yeah could you know you just brought up a great point so the author of those articles blake is saying that we're more prepared and we could handle it but you know what i disagree because the, uh, the population in china is much more used to poverty than the population of the united states uh as far as hard times at least our generation uh baby boomers and below they they really haven't uh gone through anything like uh, the generation that lived through the depression in the 30s and then had to fight a world war. So, you know, I think the Chinese are more prepared to handle this because a majority of their country, even though they've made all these advances, uh, are not in the cities and um, are used to hard times. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, 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 I guess, you know, the, 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 the kind of generation in China has gone by the wayside though as well because they, they've, they've definitely been become accustomed to better standards of living. Did I just hear Stelios just a moment, a moment ago? I think so. Yeah, he made an, he made an attempt, but, uh, you know, uh, he, he, he has some issues with the internet now. You know, yeah, small I, islands. Yeah, he's he's on an island somewhere. I saw I, I saw all these tweets of him, uh, him yeah. uh, sailing. Yeah, it's Kufonisia, wonderful, very very small and you know wonderful islands and very beautiful, uh, very scenic. But as you understand, the internet is uh, you know <laughs> you know <laughs> let's say not good is actually an underestimation. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. A All couple right. of rodents run around to spin the wheel to generate power. Yeah, um, something like that. But by the way, Blake, uh, I heard your comments before. I think the the dollar positive reaction to whatever is happening at the moment is a very myopic uh, reaction uh, because I do think that the actual event that currently put a bid under the dollar uh, in the longer term uh, will actually lead to a faster depreciation of the dollar. Um, but, you know, for the time being in the short term, this is how the market reacts and it's not unprecedented, of course. I mean, it is the go to currency, especially when we have a risk off, et cetera, along with uh, with again. So, you know, in the short term, it is what it is. And, you know, we, we, we have to acknowledge that. Right. Why? Why, Steve? Why would it change in the longer term? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to hear this as well. Because if um, if the whole issue is uh, that. Um, uh, uh, a, a potential trade war with China, for example, um, is uh, is a big fear. Um, the question is, okay, let's assume that this manifests. We have we have a potential potential trade war. Why is the dollar catching a bit at the moment? Because theoretically speaking, through a trade war and tariffs, um, uh, the U.S.'s trade deficit might might get reduced. First of all, we know. From microeconomics, that uh, tariffs um, are um, eventually uh, being nullified uh, by you know movement of currencies, etc. But most importantly, even if the trade deficit of the U.S. goes down somewhat, you know we will still have a huge trade deficit. We will still have a, a huge problem with um, a budget deficit, and you know it, it sounds counterintuitive, but as long as the U.S creates trade deficits, what it does is exports, it imports goods and exports dollars. Those same dollars are the dollars that are bidding the treasuries. They come back through treasuries as a form of a loan to the US. So in essence, they are responsible for keeping US rates quite low. So if you actually, if, even if we assume that you achieve that against China, let's say, and you start giving the Chinese less dollars, the Chinese have one less reason to uh, to, to want to buy treasuries from you because now they have less dollars and I don't think they're going to be giving their own currency to, to buy treasuries. They're buying treasuries because they're getting a lot of uh, imported dollars and they don't know what, what, that, what else to do with them. That's why. So you, 
So you you think eventually this is going to lead to to dollar weakness? I'm I, I mean that eventually uh, all, all these deficits, the, the huge deficits be, being created, um, have to find some buyer. Um, the foreigners are the buyers, so we cannot at the same time assume that the Fed is going to be uh, tightening, that they're going to be reducing the balance sheet, and at the same time that, for example, China is going to have uh, less dollars from trade to buy treasuries, because it's either one or the other. I mean, either the Fed is going to actually start monetizing the U.S. deficit once again, by expanding its balance sheet, in which case it doesn't need outside buyers for treasuries. But in this case, we definitely don't have any more um, monetary tightening. We have quite the opposite, which, as we know, is um, something that would devalue the dollar. Or, uh, you know, we, 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 we have the first issue that I mentioned. So I think that eventually, one way or another, uh, you know, dollar is going to get devalued. Mm. Hello, guys. Can you hear me? Hey, hey Stelios. Yes, can hear you. Hey, hey. I'm I'm sorry. I'm I'm having very big trouble with my connection. I just want to add. I agree with Steve, and I, I wanted to add that all this is happening while we while the Fed has been hiking, and we're slowly seeing the results of that as well. So I think it's all going to start adding up, and I can really not see any scenarios where waging trade wars with your neighbors, with China, with pretty much everybody is going to be anywhere near positive for the U.S. I mean, I just don't see it. So I'm I, I'm very skeptical of this dollar move. And yeah. I, I agree that in the medium term, uh, the dollar should find should find weakness. My but, couldn't, but, but couldn't we couldn't we couldn't we argue that the, 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 the dollar um, the dollar weak? Well, couldn't we argue that trade wars may not be good for the U.S., but they're honestly they're not going to be good for anybody. Oh, yeah, oh, I, uh, I agree, especially in the short term especially in the short term, for sure. But, okay. but I do think that, that the eventual risk here is that the whole global economy, due to that, is going to, uh, you know, uh, g you know, grind to halt. Right. So, so again, this is where you turn into the least dirty shirt in the hamper, <laughs> you know, because every shirt is dirty, which is the least dirtiest. You, you know, and that, that's when I'm like, okay, well, I, I hear what you guys are saying. But at the same time, I don't know if I really want to be a buyer of euros or a buyer of, uh, you know, of, of, of cable. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at the euro dollar thinking, you know, this euro dollar, frankly, looks like it's going back to parity. And I know that's a very bold call from where we currently stand, but I don't, I don't see, you know, g give me the reasons why I should be buying the euro right now. I can give you one. Actually, okay, I, 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 completely co coincidentally, I was actually writing in the chat room today about it. Uh, personally, I'm not buying the, the ECB's bluff. Uh, I'm not buying it that the ECB is not going to be moving until uh, next summer. And I'll give you two good reasons. Uh, and I do think that the risks, especially now that the market is pricing in that the ECB is not going to be hacking. First of all, let me say here, I do agree that the euro is moving lower from here. I mean, technically speaking, it's more than obvious. Uh, so. I do believe that you know it still has a, one more leg down to to play out, so there is no question in my mind about it. So I'm I, I'm absolutely with you in the short term. But do I believe? I mean, we know the Germans. We know that the Bundesbank is probably the most hawkish and monetary prudent uh, bank, uh, at least in the Western world, right? Um, we we know uh, Germans' obses obsession with uh, inflation and the hyperinflation they had, uh, you know, uh, during the World War period, etc. Um, currently, the ECB, we also know that the ECB had a target, an inflationary target of uh, below 2%. At some point, they, they transformed that through Draghi to below, but close to 2%. And the Eurozone's inflation currently is at 1.9%, 1, 1. which, you know, is below, but close to 2%. I mean, this is the epitome of below, but close to 2%. Uh, we had some very strong PPI numbers, which indicate that uh, you know, there, there is the high likelihood that the CPI is actually on an ascending trajectory. And most importantly, German CPI is currently running about 2.2%. Uh, do I believe that if we see another couple of months of, of strong CPI, the Bundesbank is going to stay put and wait, for example, for 
uh, Germany's inflation to reach 2.5%, 2.6% or whatever else. I, I personally don't believe so. Uh, so I do think that the chances that actually Draghi is going to break his promise to the hockey side are much more than the market is pricing in at the moment. Hmm. Well, you know, uh, I, but, but uh, I, I guess I guess the, the, the question is then, you know, at what price do you look at the euro as being attractive? And, and uh, you know, technically, I don't know. I, you know, I, I, don't. I think that I think that one fourteen fifty, which was a major breakout level, is definitely one the first level to be watching, because I do think that more or less we're going to make it there. So well, uh, you know, yeah, and we take it from there. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, uh, I, I'm frankly, I just, I, you know, I'm, I'm more at a, I'm more at a standstill right now, and I'm not. Uh, you know, obviously the euro looks, you know, looks bearish. I'm, I'm actually pretty upset that I, I had an order yesterday to, to short the euro at one sixteen forty, and I moved it overnight to one sixteen fifty five, and because I thought we were going to get closer to this thirty eight percent retracement, and obviously I missed, missed my, uh, uh, I missed my entry. Blake, so, I think Blake that uh, dollar is uh, te technically speaking. Uh, perfectly positioned against the vast majority of the currencies at the moment for further strength. But what, what I'm saying here is that I'm doubting that this can be something prolonged. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, it's, 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 uh, we'll, 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 we'll see. I think, I think it, you know, one of the, one of the other risks that are involved in the, in the dollar is, is a liquidity issue too. I mean, if, 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 the, if the market needs to seek out to buy more dollars in a you know risk off type of environment, the the market is going to have a hard time finding it, and they're going to go they're going to go through you know a lot of these majors looking for it. So I I, I think the euro dollar still has you know some downside. D does that mean I want to short it right at this moment in time? No, I feel that I've missed uh, I missed a good entry overnight so I'm, I'm and that's why I, that's why I took my dollar longs off the table with the dollar Canadian I think the dollar Canadian was reaching overnight and uh, you know is at risk of a pullback and and I actually shorted the dollar Mexican peso uh, since we're in a ascending wedge and I shorted it this morning at 68 so we're at 65 right now 66 uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for the US dollar Mexican peso to drop and I think the dollar actually comes down against some of these currencies at least, uh, you know, uh, right at this moment in time. But I, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little skeptical about trying to uh, establish a long-term uh, dollar short at this point. I, I look at the euro dollar. It's, it's, it looks like it's breaking lower. The, ca the cable has broken lower. You know, one of the scariest things about the, the cable, Steve, is that um, we have had such a shallow retracement. If you look at this, no, I agree with you. This, I agree this, with you. I mean, I, I definitely expected some bigger bounce from what. Oh my got, God! I, th I thought we would go. I thought we would see the 200-day moving average again. You know, up yeah, here. At, uh, I was looking for 136 as well. I, I I had said multiple times that I would be shorting 136 both hands, but we never made it there. Obviously, n not even close. And and it yeah. and that that's you know that that that's a pretty bearish move in the cable. I, I the pound to me looks like it's going back to the mid 120s. The Aussie dollar. I mean, this is a gross looking pair and i mean i was short that last week last week i mean here we are uh this is a daily chart last week i was short this thing at 76 cents you know with my risk above 76 uh 80 and uh i i mean i closed it on friday i want to say i closed on friday as we, we we came down to the these uh you know down down here and we broke lower but look at the, look at how bearish the aussie looks uh, yeah, Kiwi, I, th I think know. it's probably from the majors. I think the, the Aussie uh, was one of the few currencies that was actually clearly pointing out to further dollar strength. Because if you remember, the Kiwi made a, 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 um, a head fake that it might be you know, going somewhat higher again. But the Aussie, uh, despite whatever other currencies were doing, was still consolidating in, in, in what it was clearly technically speaking, a bear flag. And, yeah. you know, once once dollar started uh, getting a bid across the board, uh, as expected, the Aussie indeed proved to be by far the weakest one.
Well, I'll tell you right now. Um, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm actually short a little dollars, uh, shorting the dollar Mexican peso, just very, very small, and uh, and and frankly, I'm not even comfortable being short the dollar Mexican peso right now. I, I would like to see the dollar pull back a little bit. Um, but but you know, one of the other things I guess I'll point out before I hand it over to you, Steve, is even though I shorted the euro dollar, or uh, excuse me, even though I shorted the dollar Mexican peso, if you look at the euro dollar, if the euro dollar for some reason stages a reversal today, which, uh, you know, time will only tell, but if we do for some reason stage a reversal, this is going to end up being a false breakdown too. So, um, uh, you know, the, the false breakdown below like this 115.50. So, uh, I and I'm not banking on that. I'm not buying the euro as a result, but that's something that 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 does have my attention, just in case, you know, just just in case. So yeah, it doesn't look very likely, but you're right. If if that happens, that's going to be the case. I, I do like though. I mean, if you want to um, play something counter trend, in my opinion, at the moment, I don't mean you. I mean, I'm speaking generalized. I, I know that you don't need advice. But right. I do agree with you. I think that USD CAD is currently actually I have a confluence of resistances at 133. Uh, I had said to our friends uh, here in the uh, webinar uh, on the chat room as well that if um, USD CAD broke above this that descending trend line we had on the day and on the daily and the weekly charts that I was I was targeting in my opinion uh, as of the next stop 133. It's a confluence of resistances. It's the confluence of the ascending trend line uh, channel. And at the same time, um, uh, it is a horizontal support resistance area. Uh, if you zoom out in the chart, you'll see it has acted several times as such. So I do think that 133 is quite a nice level to see a pullback, if it is to happen, of course. USDM extend more or less the same situation. Uh, so I agree with you. I do think that if somebody, uh, don't forget also that USDM extend posted a very nice uh, bearish engulfing uh, candle to close the week last week. And that's something that it hasn't been invalidated yet. So you know, as a signal, it is something we shouldn't um, uh, we we shouldn't take lightly. So so I I do agree. I mean, those two are good candidates for a pullback if if the dollar wants to uh, pull back uh, at the moment. Yeah, we'll we'll see if it does. Um, uh, we'll I think the Swiss could be too as well, guys. I mean, it's pretty unusual. A few days in a row, Swiss led the whole thing up. And it's not making new highs here. Almost looks like a failing rally. So if the dollar came off and the Swiss can't make a new high with dollar making a new high, what would happen if we had a pullback in the dollar is what I ask myself. Yeah, it, you know, I, I, go ahead. Yeah, I would agree with you. I would agree with you, um, Dale. Keep in mind, though, that what is keeping uh, the USD Swiss, uh, you know, somewhat uh, tamed is the fact that we're seeing um Steve, I another leg okay uh, we're seeing that another leg lower has started in euro swiss here it is so if you see from the high of the, for the euro swiss if you see this is clearly some kind of a pendant right so that's definitely uh helping somewhat uh use this swiss uh, regardless though i have to say dale that so far the, cons the this consolidation, this price action that we see after that huge candle we had last week, you know, for the time being, it it looks you know as a consolidation to me. So uh, to be honest, I wouldn't be betting against the US this Swiss at the moment. I do see a clearly impulsive move higher. I do see an a move lower that is clearly corrective in nature, and we've broken above here. Yes, if we fail, it's going to be. Uh, definitely a bad signal, but do I believe that the chances of failing here are high? No, actually, I believe that the chances of failing here are rather low. I would be looking for for another push towards the 102 um, area. I don't think that this time this 105 area will act will will manage to to reverse the pair once again. I do think that we're actually probably going to break above it and uh, at least make it the next year of resistance, which is uh, 102. Um, so um, let's have a look at a few Steve, more things. The, uh, the housing starts uh, came in better than expected. And also, um, uh, the building permits came in a little worse than expected. But housing starts came in a little bit uh, little, little bit better at uh, 1.35 uh, 
million versus yeah, uh, regardless, million. regardless the market doesn't seem to be really willing to respond to that uh, by the way blake I, I missed a few minutes at the beginning because i was uh, doing some other stuff um I, I i bet you definitely mentioned the event we had with the usdn right i know that you're no you're no i didn't actually I didn't, I didn't get a chance to so you can you can go ahead and cover that and all the end pairs for for them for that matter Okay, okay, perfect, perfect. Yeah, right. then we have a lot to talk about. And by the way, I, I do think that um, uh, I do think that uh, Greg is going to be with us. Uh, at least that's uh, uh, that's what he told me earlier today. So uh, there is a chance that Greg is going to uh, join us in a few minutes. Um, awesome. So uh, definitely, definitely big, big breakdown in the USDN. I was viewing this potential as an ascending wedge. Um, I was talking uh, multiple times on the webinar as well about the importance of the 11080 area. Actually, we never managed to uh, to penetrate through that area on a daily closing basis. This looked like a, an ascending wedge, and we are indeed uh, breaking lower uh, from uh, from this um, uh, from this. So you can see that we had a huge candle overnight due to the whole. Uh, speculation about trade wars and you know Trump's uh, statement, etc. So uh, I do think that this opens the door for another move to the downside, exactly as we have drawn here, a move to at least retest the 108 level, if not go lower. Obviously, as you understand, I remember very clearly here that when we were talking about yen pairs, when actually the yen pairs were still decently bid, I had very specifically said that there are two yen pairs that I, I, I especially like for further downside. One of them I had said is the cat yen, and here it is. Uh, it's, it's breaking down, and I think, I think it's a clear uh, move lower, impulsive move lower, corrective move higher. We're breaking again. I wouldn't be surprised if we actually, if we actually ended up accelerating the downside. Um, Dale, you're unmuted, by the way. And the other one is it was the Aussie yen, simply because the Aussie yen was clearly within a bear flag, and that's what we had drawn here, right? And you see that, you know, we're now breaking below the uh, bear flags uh, support. We are also breaking below this horizontal area of support. Both of them. Um, it's also a 50% uh, uh, FIB, so all of those support areas uh, that you know were between like 81.70 and 81.37, we we are penetrating through them today. We're now testing the recent low down here at 80.50. Um, I do think that the next um, target lower should be the 61.8 at 79.26. Um, and I believe that the Aussie yen looks very nice, uh, nicely positioned for uh, for further uh, weakness. Now, um, let me switch to the Kiwi yen. Kiwi yen, we had said, is definitely not preferred in comparison to the Aussie, uh, you know, for purposes of, of sorting it. But you know the fact that it's also breaking once again below 76 is definitely not a bullish event. It's quite a bearish one, and I would expect more weakness here as well. Regardless, between the two of them, it's more than obvious. I have been saying that since you know weeks. You should go with the Aussie yen, and as you see, it indeed produces much, much uh, better results. By the way, uh, one more uh, thing to notice here: CAD yen can also be viewed as having set a head and shoulders formation here which would point to at least um a retest of the recent lows at 80 50. okay so you know an extra technical reason to be looking lower um in cardian now having to do with the usd card because i you know i orally said it but i i didn't show my chart um the reason i said that perhaps this is a good place uh, to be looking for some pullback in the USD card is you can see it here. It's the confluence of these two areas. Um, here it is exactly at 130 to uh, 80 to 133. Uh, we actually tested even the upper part of this zone today, and we seem to be slightly pulling back as we speak. Uh, I'm not saying that you know 
um, it's it's better from this point on. Obviously not, but I'm saying that you know this would be a good uh, place to be looking for at least a pullback, even if that means that uh, it's going to be a short-term pullback before resuming higher. And the reason I said that perhaps USDMXN is also a decent candidate. Two reasons here as well. First of all, the area we got rejected from, if I zoom out, you can see that it has acted as resistance in the past. Second of all, as you see, that was on Friday, a bearish engulfing candle there. We still haven't invalidated it. So, you know, on an area of resistance, we see quite a strong candlestick. Uh, of course, you know, there isn't still a technical event here in the sense that we have a steep ascending uh, channel which is still holding. Um, we do have some RSI divergence though, once again. So, you know, there are several signs that we might see, a, a, you know, a deeper pullback from there, perhaps towards the 1990 area, or perhaps, perhaps to come down and retest this broken channel at 20, you know, 28 or something, uh, at least that. So I do think that, you know, those two pairs can actually produce some kind of a pullback before uh, resuming higher. Um, now, having to do with risk, because definitely, uh, you know, um, the um, uh, what happened overnight didn't affect, affect, of course, only the FX market, but it, it strongly affected um, the, uh, you know, the risk uh, uh, in general. And, you know, we, we, we had, you know, a little bit of a bloodbath in Asian markets. And, you know, currently, S&P is like roughly 1% lower, um, NASDAQ 1.3%. Uh, like pre-open, uh, the Nikkei, as we see, uh, what? I, um... Hello, guys. Hey. Hey, mate. Welcome to the company. Whoa. What's up, Greg? I was about I, I was about to talk about risk. I mean, the risk of mo uh, move that we had overnight. Yes, it's a big risk in stocks uh and yeah I think, it is it is actually yes i think that we can it, see much lower prices in, uh, in i don't know i don't i don't know if i'm considered like a a good student of yours i was long the s p and i actually took half profits exactly the high because i i could see potentially five waves oh. higher here so you know i had a very nice exit for half of my position this is a four hour chart by the way we also had nice other side divergence and some uh, um, and some um, horizontal resistance zone. Um, uh, I know that you can't be here every day, so let me pass you the screen and you can show us what you think. Uh, sure. There you go. You should you should now have it. Okay. So you can see charts. You can see the S and P, right? Steve, Dale. Yes, absolutely. Sorry, I was muted. I I didn't realize. Uh -huh. Yes, okay. we can make. Okay, perfect. Uh, just let me mute my chats here. Uh, okay, uh, <clears throat> perfect. So actually, if you recall, uh, I warned about this reversal on the S and P five hundred. Uh, actually, it was. Uh, just uh, it was last week um, despite two different wave counts so actually the one uh, that i showed is uh, that we are we are maybe in a new bullish phase after this triangle interpretation but i was skeptical for this bullish call because of the 10-year us notes which were actually trading at the support back then so i said that based on the 10-year us notes which showed a very clear pattern I'm expecting a potential reversal lower on stocks okay and here if you look at this here is a 10-year US note with move to the downside here completed this five wave decline made a very strong breakout out of this downward channel made a pullback which I called as a wave B and now I think that we are turning higher for wave C now wave C is normally very equal compared to wave a which means there's a lot room for more upside here for wave c so this will prove to be correct then you know that stocks could see much more powerful sell-off if we consider 
that this recent decline on stocks was quite aggressive, especially on the European shares, uh, which means that this wave C rise could could actually make much more lower prices on the S&P 500 and other markets. So I will still stick with the discount as my primary one. Uh, we're also short from the uh, from around the highs. And actually, the idea for shorts was the same as you highlighted, Steve, a completed five wave rise on a smaller time frame. Okay, so if I recall this, uh, let me just pull up a new chart here. To show the idea. Yeah, that is why I actually took took ha half of my uh, long uh, out there because you know I thought that uh, you know I, I was always I was always aware of the possibility of a bearish scenario. Although I believed and I still believe that more upside is likely, uh, but at any case, you know why I was long from 2,720. I mean, since you know I saw a completed five wave move higher. Why wouldn't I at least take half half of my position off and you know take those profits? So no matter what happens afterwards, you know uh, it should, it will be okay. So, so actually, why I went short last week is reason was very simple. Firstly, I waited hope price action will respond at my identified levels. So as we spoke with Dale last week, always before I act to the trade, I want to see how market will respond. At my, at my zone that I identify as a potential support or potential resistance. So what I have noticed that despite two different wave counts last week, there was a room for more weakness. So actually the one was showing that there is room for much more aggressive sell-off as an impulsive decline for a wave C based on a potential completed ending diagonal here for a wave C of B. And the other actually suggested that we are going to see lower levels only for a wave two, sub wave two pullback. So in both cases, I said that there is room for prices to hit this 2740 area. And when I went short was actually after this first impulsive drop, which was clearly visible on 15 minute chart from the highs. Okay, so that was actually my trigger that we are going to see at least a pullback. So if someone asks me now, if we are going to see lower prices, I think that if someone who is short should definitely protect his profits, but leave targets open because the downside uh, is still big, especially if we consider 10 year US note. So despite different wave counts, we have to be uh, managing our risk properly. So actually what I would be looking here, probably turning to the bullish side, if we see uh, once again, a temp of a break here at 27.90, but till then, I will probably stay bearish here, especially because, as I said, 10 year US note has room uh, for more. Actually, upside. actually, so far today, the overnight pullback found support where one would expect to at the top of the consolidation zone that we had uh, from the middle of May to the end of May. So, uh, so far today, we, we have found support at the, the, in what is for me the first area of support, which is roughly at 2730. Um, but I agree with you, uh, definitely. Um, uh, um, I, I think, you know, that definitely a um, decisive break below uh, 2690, a daily close be below that zone, uh, will indicate that, uh, you know, the potential for more downside is quite strong, quite high. Yes, and uh, especially on the European markets, which already saw that decline, I also show, uh, showed that uh, charts as I know last week. Uh, there's still actually these blue lines that suggested the, uh, the direction that I was looking for. It was a very clear path. Okay, it was a sharp drop and slow rise. So this is classical ABC structure. It can unfold even into impulsive decline but the direction, at least for now, was the same, was looking to the downside. So this week will be quite interesting to see what happens. Um, but I think that uh, traders during this stage, like we, can see, we have seen today, with lower dollar yen, with uh, higher 10-year US notes, I think that there is a risk that stocks will see more weakness and that actually yen crosses could be pulled to the downside even more from here. So um, I think that uh, next trades could be on pullbacks uh, within these uh, current cycles that we see from the last 48 trading hours. 
Uh, <clears throat> so if we take a look at some of them, uh, here's Euro Yen that I'm looking at. Um, there's actually a potential leading diagonal that can be forming here for wave A. So watch out here for more weakness. Uh, watch out, of course, for pullbacks. Um, but if we take a look can, at dollar yen. Um, can a leading diagonal, now this is a technical uh, question, but can a leading diagonal actually be uh, not um, uh, contracting? Because if you see this formation actually you've marked there, it's a, at best a channel because if you draw the line properly, it can it's be at best extended a... as well. Sorry, can, say again, mate. Can, can be contracting diagonal yeah. or can be expanding. Okay, yeah. okay. So it, it can be expanding so, as well. Okay, okay. Yes, but the idea is that market is not very directional in wave A if there is an overlap between waves two and waves four. That's why I see uh, an overlap confirms actually the fact that there you don't see any straight bearish moves or straight bullish moves. So normally that occurs can at I the ask, can start I ask of something? the cycle or end of the cycle. From a, from a structure standpoint, uh, first of all, I do also believe, and I've said it, said it multiple times in the webinar, that the path of least resistance remains lower, both for the Euro uh, Yen and the Pound Yen. But from a structural standpoint since we had uh the first leg low in the euro yen and the pound yen actually be almost equal to the next leg lower is there still a chance that so this is a complete... yeah is there still a chance or you see something else that tells you that no this is not a possibility anymore from a structural pers perspective the reason why i'm looking at this structure uh, is actually coming from different yen crosses. It's also coming from, uh, let's take a look at us yen. Uh, got it, got it. So in essence, in essence, you let other pairs that are more clear technically tell you that that, that interpretation is probably uh, the ideal one. Okay, that, that's why I'm asking because I agree with yes, you. I do exactly. see a lot more downside in OZ yen, in pound yen, in, sorry, in, uh, in CAD yen, etc. But you know, I would be uh, more cautious with Euro yen, for example. Yes, because definitely I agree here because we are trading somehow away from the lows. Uh, so it's much, it can be a better bullish setup if maybe we see a risk on uh, playing out in the next, uh, in the second part of this week. So definitely, by the way, since, Euro since, would be since we were, since we were speaking overall, about the risk assets, but overall, I think that Japanese yen. Uh, based on dollar yen, I think the Japanese yen could strengthen. We see euro dollar in bearish mode. We see dollar yen turning to the downside, which has room for more weakness. We also covered dollar yen uh, for quite some times, uh, for quite a few times last week. I said that this was a strong decline that should take us lower after a completed corrective recovery. And after this current sell off, I think that there's a chance we will see more weakness coming through which means with the euro dollar being bearish, I think that euro yen could easily uh, stay in this mode as well. No, so, I'm 100% with you. I also see the USD yen uh, breaking down today from, I was actually monitoring uh, the, la the last pullback as an ascending wedge. Um, so I, I do agree with you. I do think that USD yen is at least on its way to retest 108, if not lower. <clears throat> so um, uh, I'm 100% with you. Um, we have questions about the DAX actually, and I'll, I'll mention here that, you know, to me, FTSE looks quite clear. I mean, I said last last week that FTSE is one of the best looking indices because it was clearly in a corrective uh, move higher after one leg lower, so there was at least one more leg lower. We see that the DAX was the DAX actually more or less posted a double top, and we also almost. see that the Nikkei. Yeah, almost. And we, we also see the Nikkei that got rejected once again from the 23,000 area of resistance, which is quite an important area. I was I was actually saying on the webinar last week that, listen, you know, I'm going to be all bullish at the Nikkei, but it first has to break above 23,000 because if it gets rejected again from 23,000, you know, that's going to be bad news. Yes. Uh, we also, as I remember a few weeks back, we also covered Nikkei together, mm -hmm. as you know. And if I take a look at Nikkei, 
actually what I covered back then is that this can be a flat formation here for wave B. So this is was the first lag of decline, then a pullback, and now we are expecting third lag of decline. So with that in mind, I think that there is room for more weakness and Again, this suggests that Japanese yen could stay strong. But as always, I try to focus on minimum expectations. So let's assume that I'm wrong and that market actually completed wave four here. This is alternate count, okay? That low is And here. wave five has already begun. Yes, in such case, what you would be looking at is for an ABC pullback and then continuation high, right? So I'll remove mm -hmm. this for, for now. Uh, actually, I can hide this. <clears throat> so, in such case, you would expect A, B, C. And again, wave C is similar to wave A, right? So, there is still, in such case, chance for prices to see more downside. Okay, because you want to see wave C falling below this wave A level. So, in such case, I think, as I said, Japanese yen, yeah, of course, if, of course, if the alternative scenario is is true, I mean, if actually we've seen the completion of wave four and we're currently on a corrective pullback after wave one of wave five, uh, then there is no more reward to risk ratio for somebody to be short. Because let's assume, Gregor, that you're shorting here. If the target is actually the equality, uh, where would you place your stop loss? If you place your stop loss above the 20, I you don't have a one-to-one -one risk reward ratio. Trading, I would not be trading Nikkei, but in such I case, agree with you. I would be trading uh, yen crosses, and I would I agree with you. Three wave corrective rallies on the intraday charts to sell. Yeah, I, I'm I'm 100% with you. I'm 100% with you. Definitely. Um, another issue that I think we should definitely speak about is the metals, because we know. Uh, and, and crude, actually, because, you know, uh, crude satisfied at least my criteria, criteria of a pullback. Now, the question is, is the move lower in crude done uh, or do you think there is more to the downside? Actually, I, I would, you know, I, I was quite bearish uh, near the highs. I was looking for a high. Um, then recently when we were consolidating, I said, no, there is more downside to crude. But after the move higher that we saw, um, I'm a little bit more skeptical. I mean, I, I would not be, um, you know, jumping the gun and assuming any more that there is more downside. So I would want to have your view as well on that. Uh, actually, I think that crude oil is still headed to the downside. Um, actually, if we take a look at this channel, we just recently just made this oh, very crude. important breakup, but still haven't seen any significant continuation to the downside. Uh, this start of this ending pattern, ending diagonal pattern was actually at $60 per barrel. It's very strong psychological level. It was also way for each other. So I think there is room for more weakness. Also, okay. if we go to the four hour chart, what we see, as I said, there was some kind of a bounce, right? But mm -hmm. if you think that this would be way to see, okay, uh, Okay, wave C. As I said, wave C, this is not a rule, but a wide line. This is two different things. But wave C to be such a small compared to this wave A is extremely rare. rare this yeah. Not like, unlikely, though, because theoretically speaking, you know, it has satisfied the minimum criteria, right? Yes, but in such case, these fake breakouts normally occurs in irregular corrections. To clear our stops, to confuse traders, they think that it market will turn to the upside. But again, it may be, it can be just part of a, something more complex correction. So what I'm looking at is that we are still in wave B. So if you look at the charts more um, robust, okay, I still think that this is going to be a corrective cycle and that we will see continuation to the downside, maybe from another retest of 67, maybe even 68 levels. But in which I case, in which case it will have probably trapped also a lot of people buying it again. If, yes. if that happens, actually. Ideal scenario, ideal scenario would be that actually we will see 
a flat here for a wave B. So a fake breakout above 67, maybe yeah, tra pushed over trapping 60, everybody long. And then turn to downside. Yes, and exactly. And this at these levels, we would also face this trend line as a potential resistance up there. So I say definitely bearish on crude oil. Also, I'm looking at the dollar cat. Dollar Is cat that around uh, 68, Greg? That line, return line, come in around 68 bucks? Uh, Depends on how fast uh, we get there. Uh, yeah. Dale. Okay. Yes, first we open down to 60, if that was your okay. question. Okay, thank you. Also, what I'm looking at is DoorCat. DoorCat just started to break into the upside. Okay, I have been warning about this potential break higher, and it looks like that we are now in progress. Now, imagine if we are in impulsive rise here, then we have a lot more um, upside coming. And even for the short term perspective, you will watch out and expect a five wave rise, but we are still in the middle of this sharp rise. So, sharp lags, this is the sharpest lag since market turned actually uh, continued hard since start of May. So I think Dave, so we actually have an interview today, so uh, so we know how much time we have with Gregor. Dale. Dale. Um, maybe Stelios knows. Uh, okay, uh, I guess Dale will answer. Let, let's let's go on, yes. uh, Gregor. Um, since so, we don't know if we have much more time, let's jump to the metals and tell me what you think there. I mean, huge. <laughs> Huge rejection for the medals, a big breakdown in gold, uh, huge rejection from uh, after a very strong move higher in uh, silver, it got rejected from, uh, you know, a weekly trend line that I'm keeping a close eye to. And it's back within that long term uh, symmetrical triangle. Uh, what do you think about the medals? What do you think about the, uh, the, gold the potential? Is, uh, yeah. It's interesting to see gold falling quite aggressively today. but in very bad times back in 2008 right we have seen metals also falling sharply with uh, with the risk of market out there okay so uh, actually to go some historical charts through you will see that there are actually some positive correlations in very uncertain times right because a lot of traders in uncertain times you will not see uh, investor picking out money from uh, stocks and putting it into gold, but he will probably sit in uh, with his money in his hands for some time before he will invest again. Okay, so that's hey, why you, you know something no, uh, it's something that I don't know how many people noticed, and I don't know if if you actually happened to notice that day, but the day that actually dollar produced that twenty dollar move, whatever the, the hell it was, it was a big move, and it actually broke down below uh, from I had it uh, you know drawn as a pennant. Um, that same day, we actually had real rates, uh, which is nominal rates minus inflation for whoever doesn't know, uh, go down as well, which is extremely, extremely rare uh, as a move. I mean, seeing at the same time um, real rates go down and gold, are, uh, gold dropping along with them. So... And, and, you know, combining that with the very, very aggressive reversal in silver, I don't know, but this move lower in metal smells funny to me. I don't know if, if, if you get what I mean. Uh, yes, but still, I mean, even if we think that, uh, so you expect more weakness or you think that there is coming a reversal? Uh, I definitely believe that the, the the move lower was funny. You know what I mean? It, it was more. Oh, it, it, it looked more induced than than anything real. So I would be very skeptical. I'm not yeah. saying. I mean, I'm the I'm the one that was advocating here. Actually, I was on the webinar like it was like an hour before, two hours maximum before gold broke, uh, broke down, and I was actually showing the pendant uh, pendant, and they were saying that listen. If it breaks down from here, it's gonna, you know, it, it has a lot more to move to the downside. It's, it's, it should at least, you know, make it to 12.65. But at the same time, you know, I'm not really convinced about this move. So that's why I'm also asking your feedback. Yes, actually, technically, there is a chance for a bullish move, but I, uh, for a bullish reversal. But I think that this move is more coming from very strong dollar. This is where it comes from. I think that, uh, and if euro dollar is really going to 
to die and continue to much lower prices despite the pullbacks that we will have definitely um, i think that there is a risk actually exists out there that gold will see lower prices but for me to confirm this bearish trend i would definitely have to see this uh, white x support to be broken because way b if we are still in incomplete bullish phase then this way b should not increase below this level but for now we are holding it so i'm really curious how, how this market will actually respond uh, at these levels and i'm just patiently waiting uh, the reaction if we see an impulsive reaction back to the upside back to uh, 1310 then I think that there still can be a chance for potential long uh, opportunity, actually. Okay, but definitely you want to see a reversal before we act and go with this market to the upside. So, Dale, do, do we have a guest waiting? I'm trying to, he says he's listening to a show. Mickey, if you are here in the room, please send a question because I put your name up there and I can't find you. So not yet, Steve. So you guys could go ahead. Okay. I'm going to keep uh, as long as he's, uh, first of all, I, I've seen all your questions, um, ladies and gents. Uh, and you know, Actually, I, we can I, also I, cover Aussie. I didn't touch Aussie. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I do think that there is a lot more downside left for Aussie though, here. Yes. And we also highlight, highlighted uh, last week this important trend line. Make sure this trend line was broken very aggressively. Uh, Indeed, the, and, and uh, the rest afterwards. End of April, we have seen a nice reversal higher, but more importantly, this reversal higher was very corrective, not impulsive. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is uh, a risk that you will see much more downside coming here, also based on this clear technical old school approach. Uh, actually, this uh, flag here is sitting on a major trend line support, which appears to be broken. So there's a risk that we'll see much lower prices here, especially if we consider that there's still a downtrend after all from away from 2011 highs. So I think that there is a very big chance that we will just continue um, to the downside. So watch out for definitely for these 2016 lows to be retested, especially because this rise, this recovery from uh, 2016 lows was overlapping slow choppy it was much slower compared to the previous decline so this was an imp impulse this was correction and you want to be on the side of the impulsive reactions which at this stage means to the downside so i think that Aussie has more room for more weakness on the short-term charts watch out for pullbacks we could be um, completing way free here in the near term maybe around 261.8 percent extension then watch out for a wave four i would be looking for wave four resistance to find at the previous lows here uh, swing lows uh so seven four ten i think it can be a very nice level for potential new reversal to the downside down to seven two hundred which is actually 161.8 percent extension of this whole corrective wave four cycle so normally that's my minimum object objective 161.8 of when when i define correction as complete i'm looking for continuation towards these uh, fib, fib levels um okay. uh, i think i saw um i i think i'm seeing your guest uh he he's with his initial probably yeah i day. got him i see it okay uh grega it's gonna be nice if you can join us again for a few minutes this week because we still had some questions that we, which obviously we didn't have enough time to cover um you know some about uh, the crosses some about more exotic currencies anyhow thank you for being here uh thank you gregor thank you Dale. Thank, thank you Dale. enjoy the interview thank you steve okay mickey i didn't know you're going to be under your initials but i'm going to make you a panelist because uh usually you don't bring charts to show and i'll put up my own charts just waiting to uh, hear your voice, and then I'll show um, some different charts. Hi, Mickey. Welcome back. Hey, thanks, Dale. Thanks for having me once again. Always my okay. pleasure. Oh, uh, you're welcome. Uh, I was searching for you. So uh, you didn't bring anything you wanted to screen share, did you? So I'm going to show the charts while we're talking. 
and you sent me an article that you've recently written that gold's not going anywhere soon. Um, how much longer? I know, you know, gold bulls say don't wait to buy gold, buy gold and wait. How long are they going to have to wait, Mickey, my friend? Well, I'm buying gold now, <laughs> okay. which I do on dips, uh, or I will be buying gold uh, at twelve seventy three fifty. Uh, okay, but I yeah, just traded there gold. today. Yeah, so I think this is a buying opportunity, and it usually is in the summertime, Dale. Um, I guess I'm a bit surprised how early what I would call the summer doldrums has. Uh, started. It usually doesn't start until sometime in July. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the gold bulls, the gold bugs, I uh, came down on them pretty hard in this musing I posted yesterday. Um, the idea of $2,000 gold, $5,000 gold, $10,000 gold, in my opinion, is simply ludicrous. Uh, if that happens, you're better off owning Guns, guns and bullets yeah. <laughs> along with your gold and food because you can't and eat food. it yeah. I, I say gas goods <laughs> gold okay. and, and I may, we may need to do this if this trade war gets out of hand so let me ask you what was the gist of the article that uh, uh, nothing's going to happen for a while is it because you expect continued dollar strength to depress it or put a lid on gold prices what's the rationale for that uh, last article that gold bulls are going to have to wait for a while. Yeah, it, it's a short term view. So near term, I would, uh, you know, I'm looking out uh, past Labor Day before I see an uptick in gold at all. And really, it does have to do uh, with the U.S. dollar now at over 95. Uh, you know, Trump is on record of wanting a weak dollar, but we have all this uh, geopolitical uh, intrigue going on in the uh, world and a very weak euro as a forex guy you're uh, aware of that so uh, uh, and and then the seasonality of gold you know we do extensive research on on commodities and how they perform in an average year and this is a seasonal low for gold so I'm looking uh, no earlier than after everybody comes back to work in September and the markets pick up for any uptick in gold. Do you see any chance of, uh, you know, uh, silver has been selling under production price. The recent rally in silver uh, didn't quite get it back to production costs. And gold production costs are where, about 1180, 1200, Mickey? Yeah, I don't think very many gold companies are ex are very profitable at this point, um, basically because they don't they you've got to really be careful when you look at their balance sheets and financial statements statements because they use non GAAP non general accounting practices uh, ways of doing their books. So if you add in all their total costs, include, including uh, sustaining capital, which they usually uh, write off and, or, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, use as, uh, or depreciate and amortize those costs uh, over the life of the mine, which is not really uh, the way that they should be doing it. They're not profitable. Concerning silver producers, silver has bounced up against resistance a couple of times. And then the US, good old US dollar takes another uh, tick up and silver loses its ground. The gold-silver ratio, which we pay a lot of attention to, uh, was above 80. Now it's fallen back down into the high 70s, but that's still uh, in the 80s. That's about a 5% anomaly over the last five, 45 years. Okay. Uh, I'm looking at uh, gold here, and to me, it looks like uh, we're threatening kind of a major uptrend here. I'm just wondering if you uh, think that uh, into the fall, uh, we might be able to see 1,200 again, if that's a possibility. Not, not many people talking about that. Uh, 1,240 is the next real important support level. That was the low that we had in the fall of 17. Uh, maybe some fear coming in uh, around midterms, Mickey. Could that be a, 
uh, possible catalyst for gold. And the last question, you bring up miners. Isn't one of their largest inputs uh, cost being energy or cost of energy to do the mining? And would lower energy prices help their balance sheet? Well, I'm going to take your last question first. And yes, energy costs are one of their major in inputs, energy and labor generally. So the, co the price oil uh, going up is going to affect gold producers. Uh, in the U.S., the strong U.S. dollar is negative for gold producers, but that's positive for gold producers with weak currencies. Uh, concerning the test of gold on the downside, I think that's a possibility. It looks to me like the bears are, are in control right now. Uh, we saw another drop on uh, about halfway through London market this morning, uh, another five bucks. So gold's weak. Uh, the uh, midterm elections, I think, could be a catalyst for gold. Uh, as we get okay. closer to that, you know, it, really the, the thing that's going to happen, I think the only way gold is really going to move one way or the other, uh, especially to the upside, let's say, is uh, if we have a black a swan event or some okay. geopolitical event or uh, the hedge funds come big on into the market on one side mm -hmm. or the other. I think that's necessary probably for for gold to uh, go on the uptick and then really the seasonality thing. And once we get through Labor Day, uh, gold generally goes up because you're into the to the high physical demand, especially from India with the festival and wedding seasons in India. OK, up until the last couple of days, in fact, midweek last week, the gold silver ratio was coming in pretty good. Silver was way outperforming gold on the upside, had a very nice mm -hmm. rally of uh, well over a dollar uh, from its recent lows while gold just moved sideways. Uh, any view on the gold silver ratio it seems to be correcting uh, since Friday where silver is weaker than gold. Uh, do you believe in that? gold silver ratio continuing to possibly regress to the mean at the say 40 50 level well eventually it will dale but i think that's a, a long a medium to long term view you know uh, we've done a lot of work on the distribution of those ratios since uh, uh, nixon started taking us off the gold standard in in 1971 and historically that range uh, uh, probably average or even the mean would be about 55 to 1. Uh, for it to get to 40 to 1, uh, silver's going to have to take a big run. And, and okay. But in volatile markets, silver always uh, uh, will either outperform or underperform, depending on if it's on the uptick or, or, or the downtick. Silver is a much more volatile uh, metal. There's going to be resistance at 20 bucks. So, if so, you know, last time silver touched 20 bucks and it was, if memory serves, a couple of years ago, didn't stay there very long. There's always a lot of silver sitting on the sidelines that will come back into the market when prices get uh, to the point that people think they can make a little money on silver. If that ratio, uh, um, it's down into that, say, 50 to 60 range. Then you're going to see a, people like me who are gold hoarders and buy silver on weakness. And then we go and uh, when that ratio uh, corrects a bit, then we'll go and trade our silver in for gold. Because, <clears throat> pardon me, in my, in my opinion, a lot of people's opinion, gold is the only real money. Okay, so you know, I, I want to give you credit because uh, when we first talked a few years ago, I think it was still with FX Street, copper was in a bear market, was under two bucks, and you're very constructive, uh, excuse the pun, because it's using <laughs> construction, uh, the copper market under two bucks. Uh, the last uh, couple weeks, uh, we've had some damage here. I'm not sure if it's because of uh, uh, trade tensions, but it looks like uh, even copper is vulnerable here. Uh, view on copper still constructive? Well, I very much am on copper as constructive. Uh, I don't think it's in the short term, and I I wrote a piece uh, 
a month or probably six weeks ago um, about the confusion in the copper market uh, uh, and the the copper's been range bound sometime where between 305 and 330 over uh, since what uh, maybe October and it doesn't seem to be able to break out either up on the upside or the downside. We saw quite a move in copper a couple of weeks ago, and that was solely predicated on, on the worries over strikes at Escondida, uh, the world's largest copper mine in northern Chile, uh, as those concerns have waned a bit, and the drop dead uh, date on that labor contract is July 31st as those concerns have abated somewhat and also the Trump tariff uh, turmoil going on right now um, we've seen copper take another dive uh, and but if you look at all the metals right now they're pretty much tracking gold I mean or uh, pardon me they're tracking the US dollar index today above 95 and that's uh, something on the order of a eight or 10 month high for the dollar index. So uh, I think we need uh, a weaker dollar uh, for these metals to perform to the upside. But I am very bullish on copper in the medium to long term. Just okay. on the I also know supply demand fundamentals, pardon me. Okay. Um, and uh, I know that you were a big believer in the uranium market. I'm trying to pull up a uh, uranium symbol. Uh, I can't find anything that's going to uh, work. I have a lot of uranium issues up here, but uh, world, how about this? World uranium index. Okay, let's see what that looks like. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with this index, but it does show from 2016, pretty nice advance in uranium uh, uh, what's your take on it and uh will demand uh maybe people get bearish uranium because kim jong-un is going to stop his nuclear program we won't need as much uranium unless the iranians uh take up uh the supply that uh north korea is not going to use anymore and i'm just being facetious uh <laughs> looks, it look, looks pretty looks pretty constructive here on this chart uh mickey uh you, you still like it and uh, where do you play in that field? Well, I do like uranium. Uh, if there's one thing I can be accused of being a permeable, it's uranium. And it hasn't it happened as fast as I hoped it would or thought it would. Um, but, you know, from a low of uh, about $18 on the spot price, we're now at more or less $20 three dollars over the last year and a half perhaps um mm -hmm. but the, it's all about supply demand fundamentals in uranium and we have had a short-term oversupply we have lots of catalysts that have happened or are happening uh now that that lead contrarians such as me to think that uh the Uranium price is going to break out at some point. Now, no one's going to be able to tell you why, but lots of stuff going on with Kazakhstan, which is the world's largest producer, cutting back. Uh, uh, Trump is on board with uh, uh, some sort of, of credits for your domestic uranium producers. The real concern here, Dale, is the U.S. last year produced about 2% of the uranium it uses and all in nuclear power plants. In fact, 99.99% right. of the world's uranium is used in power plants, not used in making bombs. Uh, bombs are generally made with plutonium, not uranium. Okay. Um, okay. So, so where do we get, where do we get most of our supply, Kazakhstan? Uh, well, we get most of our supply from Canada. Second okay. is Australia. Third is Kazakhstan, fourth is Russia, six of the top 10 uranium producers in the world uh, are countries that are unfriendly to the U.S. And we get about 40 percent of our supply from uh, Russia and satellite countries in the former Soviet Union, specifically Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, not the most stable parts of the world and no, that's certainly not friendly to the U.S. 
and how much from Canada and Australia, which might still be our friends, but uh, becoming shakier because of what's happening politically and on the trade front? Well, uh, we get significant amount, uh, you know, I'm pulling this off the top of my head. I would guesstimate that we get something on the order of about 50% of our supply combined, 40 to 50% from Canada and Australia. But Dale, you know, I'm going to take a bit of a different view here. Uh, Canadians are, be are our best friends forever. Uh, forever, okay. Negotiating ploys and uh, the way Trump does this, uh, we're going to kiss and make up with the Canadians. Uh, I think what really Trump is aiming for, especially with the Canadians in Mexico, is an Ameri a North America trade free zone. And you know, uh, I take the, the task tack that, uh, you know, there's lots of tariffs that the U.S. pays for Canadian goods or we're restricted uh, in shipping our farm products to Canada as they have a supply managed uh, uh, economy up there. So um, when it all comes out the wash, we're going to be friends with the Canadians, I think. Okay. Well, uh, I hope so. And, uh, you know, because Canadians and Aussies have fought side by side with us and have, have sacrificed many uh, people in our efforts for freedom and maybe even political uh, wars that weren't even that favorable. So uh, I hope that money doesn't pollute uh, the relationship that has this type of historical uh, so many years behind it of uh, blood and treasure and cooperation. So, Mickey, I have your website up here, and uh, uh, yes, looking sir. at things that you do, uh, you have a newsletter. That's is that correct? Subscribe yes, to your mu musings, so our viewers could go to your website, mercenarygeologist.com, and get your newsletter. What uh, the mentoring is that? What you do with? Uh, uh, other in, uh, uh, aspiring geologists that you mentor them, or uh, what kind of mentoring do you do here? Uh, I mentor uh, aspiring young people all the way age from age from seven to uh, millennials in their early twenties, uh, trying to encourage people to become geologists if they're young. Okay. They are geologists do a lot of mentoring on how to find a job, uh, how to present interview, lots of different sorts of uh, things I do. I speak uh, two or three times a year at, at uh, mining universities, mining schools in the Western US. Uh, occasionally I go to second grade classes and, and carry all my geology uh, gear and try to encourage them to uh, to love the outdoors, you know, I became a geologist because I love the outdoors and I love rocks and a rock collection since age seven. Um, so, well, uh, you, had, uh, well, then you ought to, uh, you know, examine my head. It's a few rocks in there, buddy. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's always a pleasure talking to you, Mickey, and I encourage people if they want to know, uh, do you cover any kind of mining chairs that you have an interest in here that you track? Or yeah, that... yeah. If you, uh, I, I currently cover two companies. I cover Trilogy Metals, which is uh, an advanced copper explorer developer in Northwest Alaska, and I cover a company, a Nevada royalty prospect generator company called Ely Gold Royalties. Um, okay. And on my musings page, I have two different. Uh, 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 newsletters, if you will, uh, and the mercenary alerts are about companies I cover, and, okay. and those are restricted to subscribers only for at least a month. So if you want my stock picks, you need to be a subscriber, but it's free, so hell, the price is right. Why wouldn't you? And so we've done quite well picking stocks over the years, um, and uh, I encourage people to sign up and uh, and see what I have to say. I write a lot about commodities. Uh, I'm a 
a hardcore libertarian, so I write about those sorts of uh, philosophies and and political stances too. So uh, I think people will be entertained. Okay, well, if you're a heavy metal fan, I'm not talking Metallica. I'm talking Mickey Fulp. Uh, go to Mickey's website and keep in touch with somebody who uh, doesn't uh, look at mining shares from afar, but uh, knows it from the ground up, literally, from going out there and visiting sites and looking at geological prospects of different properties. So thanks again, Mickey, for uh, coming in to edify our community about what's happening here. And uh, good hunting the rest of the year. And um, uh, hopefully we have a Lazarus effect on some of these precious metals going into the midterms. That's what, yeah, I'm kind of with you on when I'm looking for lows. Late summer, fall event for me too. So it was great listening to you and thank you for edifying us today. Well, thanks for your kind word as always, Dale. And, uh, and I look forward to talking to you once again and see if my predictions come to pass. Okay, let's get back together in the fall and uh, see how things are developing in the metals market. Everyone, thank Mickey Fulp, Mercenary Geologist. You could follow him on Twitter at Mercenary Geo. Thank you, Mickey, my trading warrior brother. Thanks good luck and, and good hunting, buddy. You too. Okay, everyone, that's Turnaround Tuesday. See everybody tomorrow. Good hunting the rest of the day. Remember, don't just count your pips. Count your blessings. See everyone tomorrow. Adios.